So, Prinhaun Da Akroizo, uh, good afternoon and welcome to Public Health Network Cymru's webinar series. Uh, my name is Neris Edmonds, I'm a Principal Public Health Practitioner in the Wales Health Impact Assessment Support Unit in Public Health Wales, and I'm going to be chairing the session this afternoon. Uh, I'm currently working on a health impact assessment of climate change in Wales, so this uh, subject of this webinar is really important to my work and I'm really pleased to see this uh, on the agenda and I'd like to thank everybody who's attending and presenting for giving their time uh, to focus on this topic this afternoon. Um, just before I get into introducing the session, uh, we've got a few housekeeping notes that I'm just going to cover. Um, so there is a chance to ask questions. If you've got any questions or comments as we go through, please put them in the chat bar and uh, we hope to have time at the end. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and it will be put up on the Public Health Network Cymru website after the session. English and Welsh subtitles are available uh, using the bottom right hand button on your screen. Please be aware that sometimes the Welsh translation isn't completely accurate. If you've got any technical issues, please use the chat function and the team will do their best to resolve it. Um, we're going to have five presenters today and they're going to talk one after each other. So um, all the questions will be taken uh, at the end of the session. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the One Health approach and in particular in relation to sustainable development, the nature and climate emergencies. And last year the Chief Medical Officer for Wales highlighted the One Health approach in his special report. Um, so today we're going to be uh, looking at what is meant by One Health and why it's become more visible in the light of the COVID-19 pandemic and also how One Health approaches can be embedded in tackling the climate and nature emergencies and to improve population health and well-being in Wales um, and I think it's, we've got a really great range of speakers giving a, a range of examples from across the One Health spectrum so that's really helpful. Um, I think you know this is a really important subject I think uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with the UK climate change risk assessment um, that came out last year but they've particularly flagged areas for urgent action in the next two years. I uh, just want to give you three high, well, four highlights from that. One is that our, our current level, uh, the, gap, the gap is basically widening between the level of ab adaptation we need to make and what we're actually doing. Um, so we really need to be accelerating our response to these issues. Uh, secondly, the magnitude of risk to human health, particularly from heat, is a top priority for action in the next two years and is currently rated as high risk for the next century. Uh, also risks to a range of habitats and ecosystems, which is obviously bringing in uh, the sort of ecosystem and animal health uh, element and also risks to food security as well are highlighted as a top priority for the next two years. So I don't think this topic could be more relevant to addressing some of those urgent issues. So I'm really pleased um, to be attending and being part of this event today. I'm just going to introduce our speakers and then we will get going because we've got a packed, we've got a packed agenda. So our first speaker will be Dr Mark Davis, a consultant in public health from Swansea uh, Bay Public Health team and Mark's going to introduce the one Health concept. After Mark will be Dr Goshia Shivonia, who is the veterinary lead for animal disease policy team in Welsh Government. Uh, we've then got Adam Powell, who's a research associate from the Institute of Biological, Environmental and Rural Sciences at Aberystwyth University. And Adam's going to be speaking to us about responsible antimicrobial use in Welsh veterinary practice. Then we've got Amanda Davis from Swansea University Health Board and um, Amanda's going to be talking about community supported agriculture at Morriston Hospital. I'm particularly excited about that because I'm a member of a community supported agricultural project on the Gower. Um, so I'm, it's great to see that work expanding. We've then got Professor Charles Musselwaite, who's Chair in Psychology at Aberystwyth University, who's going to talk to us about transport and One Health, and then Professor Nigel Holt, Head of Psychology at Aberystwyth, who's going to talk about One Health psychology and behaviour change. So we've got a fantastic array of speakers. Um, it's going to be quite tight timing this session, but we do aim to have time for questions at the end. Um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Mark for our introduction. Thanks, Mark. Brilliant. Um, thanks, Neris, and afternoon, everyone. Um, yes, as Neris has said, um, we've got quite a few speakers this afternoon, so it will be a bit of a 
whistle stop tour of all things one health but i think that's quite useful at this stage because i think it just sets the scene really about how complex these issues are and actually the importance of working across multiple different disciplines and um, so hopefully this is a starting point for future discussions and collaborations and conversations about this so yes there'll be a lot of different content being covered today but hopefully through the chat and the Q&A at the end as I said this will be the start of a, an ongoing conversation um, so as Neris has already alluded to the, the main context for this is this increase in narrative and importance around the climate and nature emergency and in Wales through the programme for government um, the climate and nature emergency has been highlighted as one of the key well-being objectives um, also, Neris has alluded to, there's lots of evidence, and I'm sure there's lots of us on the call here today that are collecting the evidence and communicating the evidence of why it's a climate and nature emergency and some of the steps we can do to mitigate and adapt to that. And um, that won't be the focus of this session, but feel free again to use the chat to share any resources or infographics that you may have. What we're trying to focus on in this session is to take the next step forward. So once we've acknowledged there is a climate and nature emergency, what can we do about it? And more importantly, how do we work together on some of these complex cross-cutting issues? Um, so next slide, please. Thank you. Um, again, Neris has already introduced this nicely, so um, I'll just cover this first bullet point very briefly just to set the scene about what we mean by One Health and why the pandemic itself has brought it up the policy agenda. And then the rest of the session then will be an opportunity to listen to a range of speakers, a range of presentations about what One Health looks like in practice. And again, to stimulate the discussion and thought really about how we can embed this in our practice. So next slide, please. So there's lots of different definitions of One Health and that's one of the challenges of trying to turn it into something practical is what we mean by One Health. But we are fortunate now that off the back of the pandemic and it moving up the policy agenda, there's been a um, global collaboration trying to essentially unpick what we mean by One Health. So as you can see here, it's a, well, they did refer to it as a tripartite plus collaboration. So you can see we've got WHO here, World Organization for Animal Health, Food and Agriculture Organization and the UN Environment Programme. So they're working together on trying to define what we mean by One Health. So this is one of the most useful definitions really to help us understand what we mean by One Health. And essentially it's an integrated unifying approach um, that aims to sustainably balance and optimise the health of people, animals and ecosystems. And again, the approach mobilises multiple sectors, disciplines and communities at different levels of society. I'll leave that there. Uh, that's just to give a bit of context, I suppose, to keep coming back to what we mean by One Health. So the key thing there is recognising that it's more than human health, more than animal health, more than environmental health on its own. It's the interrelatedness of those three parts. Uh, next slide, please. And this is, again, just turning that definition into a visual representation. So again, the more you unpack the definition, you start to realise how complex that definition is but I think that's what's key um, and what's important in the One Health approach is, is recognising that complexity and working within that complexity so as you can see it's looking at humans animals and ecosystems um, but importantly how that works with different sectors disciplines and different levels of society so hopefully through the presentations today you'll get a feel of what that starts to look like in practice um, next slide please um, and as we've alluded to before, um, so COVID itself has helped um, increase the relevance of One Health and increase the prominence of One Health in, in policy, both in Wales and, and internationally as well. Um, and this is just um, key phrases really and, and concepts taken out of the CMO's most recent annual report. So it's just making that link between pandemics and the drivers of pandemics been very similar to those that contribute to climate change and biodiversity loss. Um, importantly, these have been brought about by human activity um, and therefore a key component of our response should be to minimise the impact of human activity on animal and environmental health. And one of the key recommendations from that report then was to ensure that we um, develop a One Health approach to a number of these issues. 
Uh, next slide, please. So not only has it um, emerged in the policy agenda in Wales, it's also been picked up internationally, as I said, and this is just one example of that. Um, so this is taken from a pan-European commission on health and sustainable development. Again, this is all in the context of learning from COVID. How do we build back better? How do we embed sustainable recovery into our COVID recovery planning? And as you can see here, one of the key recommendations here was for countries to establish cross-government One Health strategies based on the concept of health in all policies to safeguard future generations from existential threats. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is the last slide for me. So this is some of the work that has been going on in Wales just to try and take the next steps of moving beyond that narrative and the policy environment that's enabling us to work in a One Health way and starting to unpick actually what do we mean by that and what does that look like in practice? So this was some work done by myself and some others in the whole of our public health team. And this involved speaking to various stakeholders and just identifying actually what does One Health look like on the ground? What sort of topics, what sort of ways of working um, can help actually turn this into something tangible on the ground? And four of these key themes were identified um, and I'll just leave them there and I won't read through them. But what I've done is highlight um, the topics within this, which will be covered in the presentations going forward. And it's neatly in this order as well. So you'll hear from Sasha and Adam, first of all, in the context of health protection and emergency resilience. Um, Amanda then will talk to you about the food system and what One Health looks like in that context. Uh, then we have Charles looking at climate change in the context of transport and One Health. And then we have Nigel finishing off then looking about some of the cross-cutting interdisciplinary approaches, including um, psychology and behavioural science in One Health. So I'll leave that there. Um, I think if we go to the next slide now, we're off straight into the different presentations. So if we start with Gosha, um, and I'll hand over to you to talk about the uh, most recent avian influenza outbreak in the UK. Over to you. Thank you very much, Mark. Good afternoon, Prince Hounda, everybody. My name is Gosha Shivonia. I work as a veterinary advisor for um, Chief Veterinary Officer in Wales. And uh, I would like to speak to you regarding avian influenza outbreak, the worst that we had ever in the United Kingdom so far. Um, so if I can have the next slide, I will just introduce um, the subject of avian influenza. So it is a viral disease caused by uh, influenza A virus. Um, we uh, in animal world, we distinguish two types of avian influenza uh, depending on the severity of the symptoms, highly pathogenic avian influenza and low pathogenic avian influenza. Um, so the, the one that we experienced this year, it's uh, in the family of the high pathogenic avian influenza and it uh, can be characterized by um, symptoms like swollen heads, uh, blue discoloration of the necks and throat in, uh, in poultry, um, loss of appetite, uh, respiratory distress, but most of all, mortality. So just to give you a full scale of, um, of potential mortality. So if we've got potentially a house with 32,000 laying flock, um, then the mortality can um, um, be of the range of between 50 and 100 percent. So it, it is a massive, um, um, massive um, mortality. Um, unfortunately, um, avian influenza uh, is one of those diseases that we call potentially zoonotic. So it can spread from poultry to people. It doesn't happen very often. Uh, however, it really depends on the strain. Low pathogenic avian influenza is quite common in the a population of the wild birds and um, sometimes occasionally in the poultry population as well. However, it doesn't show uh, sometimes clinically. Uh, it can be a subclinical uh, presentation without any clinical signs. If I can have the next slide, please. So where it actually comes from. So uh, it comes with the wild migratory wa waterfowl. Uh, it comes from the east. In, uh, in this picture, you can see the pathways where the birds are uh, migrating every year. So each uh, summer, uh, the birds are migrating from uh, around Russia and Kazakhstan and they migrate towards west uh, through the whole Europe. And uh, some of the uh, winter grounds are located in the 
United Kingdoms. Those dots that you can see, that these are unfortunately the findings of a hypothogenic avian influenza between the September 2021 and March 2022. Uh, they include outbreaks in poultry, but also wild bird findings. Next slide, please. So is it a major na nature emergency? This year, um, if I can have all the pictures, please, uh, in the slide. So this year it was actually uh, quite um, uh, painful for the wildlife population as well. Uh, probably uh, some of the headlines you are familiar with already. So um, more than 5,000 wild uh, cranes died in um, Israel, in Hula Lake. Uh, that was um, the, the first, um, this kind of event, uh, massive die off reported um, in uh, in this region, but also in UK we had some um, massive die offs. Um, both of them are located in Scotland. However, um, it's not ruled out that it might had to ha might happen as well in Wales. So one in Solway Coast where uh, approximately 20% of the 40,000 uh, flock um, barnacle geese died because of hypothogenic avian influenza and just recently we've been aware that uh, birds are still dying this time near uh, Cromarty Firth um, and um, pink-footed geese are affected uh, and dying in hundreds. Um, unfortunately, wild waterfowl uh, can uh, contaminate the environment and uh, through the contact with uh, direct or indirect contact with our poultry population, they can spill the infection to uh, our domestic birds. Can I have the next slide, please? So this is how the situation uh, looked like uh, for our domestic population of captive birds, including poultry. So, so far we had 109 infected premises. This is how we call the premises that we have a diagnosis of hypothogenic avian influenza. All of them uh, with single strain, age five and one this year. Um, we, um, we had different strains of influenza A virus circulating in the previous years. So we had five infected premises in Wales, nine in Scotland, six in Northern Ireland and 89 so far in England. We had one each in the Isle of Man and Jersey Island as well. For the comparison, last season we also been, we were affected by hypothogenic avian influenza um, outbreak, but we had only 26 infected premises and there are really wide ranging um, uh, subtypes, subtypes of the virus, uh, H5N8, H5N5, H5N1 and H5N3 actually circulating. In the previous years, we had just single um, single IPs uh, apart from the year 2016 and 2017 when we had 13 infected premises. For this season, this last winter, for the first time we saw clustering of the infected premises as well in some areas like North Yorkshire, Lincolnshire, Leicestershire, Cheshire. Um, so we had those infected premises very close to each other, um, sometimes connected by the same ownership. Next slide, please. So uh, we are trying to monitor regarding what is happening and what is coming our way through um, um, testing of the wild birds, the dead wild birds that are found. So I just included the number here because if you are coming across any wild dead waterfowl or any wild bird, you can report it and um, uh, hopefully that will feed into our surveillance system. So, so far we had um, um, nearly 1,000, um, because it's more now uh, as, as I speak today, um, more than 1,000 positive findings uh, among the wild birds um, in uh, in United Kingdom and in across 247 locations, 73 counties affected. Some of them, they are in wild migratory uh, waterfowl. Some of them are in our domestic birds that they've never uh, traveled up, uh, outside of the United Kingdom. Next slide, please. 
So um, I mentioned uh, that this year we were affected by the strain H5N1 virus. Uh, we call this virus as a European strain um, in um, to um, show the difference between the Asian strain of this virus as well that was circulating in Europe in 2006. There is a big difference between those two strains, even though the name is the same, uh, because they are actually uh, showing a different affiliation to, uh, mammalian, some, uh, to mammalian cells. So um, we are just trying to monitor whether there is any increased risk for um, mam um, mammals to be affected with uh, avian uh, influenza. Um, and um, each um, isolate is going through the um, uh, sequencing. And this year's virus um, is um, having actually three different strains. Uh, we gave the names uh, by the names of the infected premises. So uh, AIV07 was the first um, infected premises that was located in England in late October 2021. AIV08 uh, was uh, located in Wales in early November and in early November as well AIV09 that was located in Scotland. So all three administrations were affected nearly at the same time and uh, they were having a slight difference in some proteins um, in the in the virus um, uh, PB2, PB2 and PA uh, protein were uh, a little bit different showing that um, the virus came through probably three different migratory routes to the United Kingdom. Can I have the next slide please? So, uh, as I mentioned, um, avian influenza can be uh, a zoonotic disease. Uh, public health authorities that worked with us very closely have uh, assessed the risk to humans as very low. It doesn't matter, uh, though, um, uh, in terms of the follow ups, because every time when somebody was exposed to high pathogenic avian influenza, um, the public health authorities uh, were very helpful in following those cases, um, asking people whether they were exposed and how exposed. Uh, to the virus they were, whether they were wearing PPE, um, and uh, some of the uh, some of, uh, some of the individuals had to receive uh, antiviral treatment as well as a precaution. But this year, first time as well, we had a first human case of bird flu that was detected in the, it was in one of the premises in Devon. Um, Every time when we've got um, an infected premise, there is a, a, a thorough epidemiological investigation undertaken, and uh, it exposed that uh, some some of the interactions between the poultry and humans are very close. Um, this particular gentleman that was affected was actually um, having um, ducks in in his bed in his house, so unfortunately that caused that um, the virus had uh, a good opportunity just to jump from. Uh, the bird to humans. Um, I think it's extremely important um, potentially uh, for looking for the future if we've got a strain of the virus that um, has a little bit different um, uh, structure and um, may mut mutate or reassort into a strain that is of higher risk uh, for, for mammals. Next slide please. So just skimming through our control strategies that we've got at the moment. So every infected premises, we've got stamping out policy. So we call the birds that are affected. Of course, that doesn't apply to any wild uh, wild birds that potentially are still um, are flying around. Uh, we are trying to contain uh, the disease as quickly as possible. We've got some uh, derogations from this rule. If um, the birds that are that are affected are part of the zoo or a collection that um, is of a, a high breeding value or a scientific value. Uh, so um, majority of the birds uh, are culled. Uh, we place the restrictions in place. We've got full epidemiological investigation and a sort of a tracing exercise. Uh, we set up the zones, uh, two zones, three kilometer um, protection zone and 10 kilometer surveillance zone around the premises where the restrictions on the movement of poultry uh, is applied. We are trying to raise awareness um, of the keepers uh, regarding the clinical symptoms in those areas. So we hope that uh, as soon as 
the clinical situation worsen, it is reported. However, we sent um, veterinarians and local authority uh, officers uh, to those premises uh, to inspect the birds and in some circumstances to take the blood samples. So we've got a full scale of surveillance in place and we strictly cooperate with uh, animal and plant health agency, uh, public health authorities, um, local authorities, with wildlife specialists and private veterinarians. And I think that concludes my presentation. I think I've got one more slide just to cheer you up. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you very much. <clears throat> OK, I uh, hope you can all hear me. Thank you very much for uh, organising uh, this today. My name is Dr. Adam Powell and I'll be talking to you about the RWIME DGC project um, as part of um, Aberystwyth University. So hopefully you'll, you'll appreciate uh, that uh, animal health is, is a massively fundamental part of, of One Health. Uh, you have heard of the O'Neill report um, and, and uh, those, those uh, requirements are devolved not just to country but also to, to industry and sector. So the particular um, implementation plan that we're working with and, and helping to deliver is this big purple book, and it's the, the Welsh Government's report on um, animals uh, and antimicrobial resistance in the environment. What this project is really trying to deliver on is, is two strands of that, which is uh, improving the standards of antibiotic selection uh, and supply and prescribing. So, of course, just like doctors have to prescribe, veterinarians are prescribing for animals um, in Wales. Next slide, please. So this is where it again crosses over in a slightly more indirect way with One Health. And, and a lot of what Aberystwyth is doing is kind of a more psychological approach. We're all aware how, how uh, resistance to antibiotics has developed. But uh, underlying all this and how we're working with vets is that the actual mechanisms, how vets talk to farmers and how society uh, really understands this in general. It's a profoundly social aspect and in terms of, of trying to uh, fight against the tide of antimicrobial uh, resistance. Next slide, please. So it's difficult to talk about this current project with, without uh, referring to a previous, actually award-winning project, uh, our wine Vet Cymru, which uh, ran for two years until um, uh, earlier last year. So what the team did was to develop a national collaborative network of highly motivated and trained vets across Wales. So that's really one vet from each uh, veterinary practice. Uh, that's either uh, practices that are totally farm uh, orientated or a bit of both um, of farm um, and pet practice. Um, and these, uh, it's very uh, e easy to, to contact these people. Um, they are responsible for, for being the prescribing champion um, within the particular vet practice. And, and the team offered um, an advanced training program and various discussion groups with a series of workshops. Uh, next slide, please. So the current project, Arline DGC, what Aberystwyth are doing is to continue the network, trying to increase the role, uh, and also one or two uh, specific strands, which is uh, trying to widen the remit and also uh, the number of people who are involved. So I'm aware I'm presenting today, but this uh, entire uh, concept was conceived by uh, Dr. Gwen Rees, who, who's uh, not able to talk today. Um, so as I said before, it's really facilitating um, local vets to put sustainable prescriptions of antimicrobials. And, and this is not a top down thing, this is much, much of a bottom up. It's profession led, uh, it's collaborative and really the vets are, are really core and fundamental for this um, idea of self-determination uh, where they're talking about what potentially they want to do and how they see uh, some of these initiatives going ahead. Uh, we're not here either to say you can't use anti antimicrobials uh, and the mantra really, which um, you may have heard before, is to prescribe as little as possible, uh, but as often as is necessary. And on the left there, you can see all the, the, the relevant veterinary practice across Wales, There's around about 50 of them, and we're currently talking um, to, to most of, of those vet practices. Next slide, please. Uh, and, and possibly press again, thank you. Um, yes, so the next steps really to maintain and develop the network. There's a few uh, practices that we um, have yet to uh, talk with, but we've, we've recruited about uh, further six or seven uh, VPCs over the last couple of months. As part of their uh, continued professional development uh, and also wish to maintain the existing network. And this is achieved really with uh, various uh, discussion groups, uh, CPT events. Um, our webinar season is about to start at the end of this month. We should have eight or nine of those webinars. 
Uh, there's a knowledge exchange and resource hub at the website, uh, but also various steering groups and discussion groups for the uh, for, for various strands that we add to wish to add to this particular project. Uh, next slide, please. So those are what we wish to develop a code of conduct, um, and this is a participatory development. And uh, quite apt for Wales, we want to get Welsh vets seen from the same hymn sheet. So within the practice, different vets might have different ideas. So there's certainly going to be differences between practices. And that's really the code of conduct for general um, antimicrobial use. And then in tandem with that, we're going to develop clinical guidelines. And that's really choosing a key two or three uh, diseases in both cattle and sheep and trying to really work together in, in terms of how uh, every every vet hopefully should should work to, to solving those particular diseases. Again, working as key stakeholders and, and using real world experimental evidence to help develop those um, over the coming year. Um, and also we wish to expand into the equine sector. Uh, we're offering um, uh, free clinical um, events for, for horse owners, and we're going to look at a relatively new area, which is to look at um, antimicrobial use within, within horses. Uh, next slide, please. So the last few slides here, I'm just trying to put this into a, a more um, obvious um, realm of One Health. So I did have a quick look at uh, various statistics and believe it or not, in Wales, uh, there's about 25,000 farm holdings of all sizes. These are quite usually quite extensive in terms of sheep and cattle. Um, in terms of farmland, well, taking uh, into account small bits of arable land and forestry, it's probably about seven or eight out of um, of every 10 hectares is actually pastoral land. And this is the kind of land that you'd walk your dog through. You might even be living quite close to it. And we're outnumbered. I mean, in sheep alone, there's about three times as many sheep as there are people in Wales. A uh, significant uh, number of cattle from, from beef and dairy se uh, subsectors and, and a lot of, uh, of poultry and, and, and pigs as well. So if you have a farm, you're probably going to be uh, legally uh, required to have a vet who is caring for them. Um, there's about 50 farm uh, vet practices in Wales, and this project is talking and influencing most of them. Um, already in the previous project, uh, we've produced policy recommendations um, and champions have met with uh, with Welsh government. And and 75%, probably probably more than that now, probably more close to 90% plus of Welsh farm practices are now actively improving their antibiotic use through through the previous and and the current current project. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is my penultimate slide. Um, this is just to give you an opportunity to, to uh, look at one of our collaborators, Welsh Lamb and Beef Producers. So what they are doing is an additional quality assurance scheme and they uh, about 70 or 80 percent of the sector are actually uh, members uh, of, of Welsh Lamb and Beef. And they have created an antimicrobial use calculator. This is a very user friendly um, portal for vets to at not just sectoral level, but actually at herd and farm level, um, be able to see what and when uh, they have prescribed antibiotics. This is very important for you to monitor and just to, um, for surveillance and actually to um, see how various initiatives have actually um, worked or have not worked. And most of our near neighbours, other countries, are looking with very jealous eyes about what Wales is doing in this regard. Um, we've also got colleagues talking about project legacy and PR for what is really going to become in the next few years, hopefully premium Welsh products. Um, so whether it's retail or wholesale or, should, or even dare I say institutional procurement, please look out for these good quality Welsh products that are, are part of, of this project. Uh, last and final slide, please. So that's a very big thank you. It's a very whistle stop tour, as I'm sure you can imagine. Just talk about some of our other partners. Um, Yaki Dara are veterinary surgeons and they're working with uh, a biosecurity app. Uh, Mentra Business are, are actually sort of ground truthing uh, various um, gadgets and technology to try and help preventative care for animals. And, and University of Bristol are doing um, more of a, a typical environmental and farm um, a bacteria analysis. And, and that's really it from me. Uh, Gwen is, is not able to talk today. And, um, please get in contact with, with Alison Bard, who's, who's leading the, the Agorist with Strand uh, at the moment. Thank you very much in, indeed. Thanks, Adam. So we go on to, to my slide. So hi, everybody. My name is Amanda Davis. I'm the um, Service Improvement Manager at uh, Swansea Bay Health Board. I'm just going to chat to you about um, a CSA that we're establishing on the Morriston Hospital site. Should we go to the next slide, please? 
So what is a CSA? So firstly, they're not allotments. I think there's a preconception that they're, lo they're allotments, they're not. What they are, they're a not-for-profit partnership between farmers and consumers where responsibilities and rewards are shared. Members pay monthly subscriptions and then in return they get uh, locally grown organic produce and they have the opportunity then to get involved in the running and the influence of the CSA. It also addresses increasing concerns around food security. So it's one of the, one of the positives of it. The most common produce for CSAs is vegetables. But um, as they grow in, there's also other CSAs that include eggs, bees, fruit and dairy produce as well. Next slide, please. So benefits for a community supported agriculture with well, benefits are for all. Uh, farmers receive a stable and secure income and, and form close uh, connections with the community. And then the members benefit by having fresh, healthy, organic, uh, local food. Uh, and they know exactly where the food has come from. And also if they want to volunteer, they can learn new skills and form friendships. <coughs> right, next slide, please. So the CSA at Morriston so it sort of started really um, last year. Uh, as Neris mentioned earlier, there is a, there's currently two CSAs and they're both on Gower. So NRW, in conjunction with the CSA on Gower, did a feasibility to, to study to see if there was a demand for um, a CSA in the Swansea East Street region, and there was. We became aware that uh, Swansea Food Poverty Network had been approached uh, by the CSA looking for land within the area. Part of my portfolio is that I manage land and property for the health board. And um, so somebody approached me and so said, you know, you know, the CSA were looking for it and did I have anything available? As it is, we, we do. We've got, we've got land at Morriston. Um, one of the fields was unsuitable for healthcare development and was only being used for grazing. Once I learned more about, bit more about the CSA, obviously there's clear correlation between what um, between health and the CSA objectives. So we approached the CSA, went down for an initial visit to Kai Tan, which is down in Park Mill um, in January last year, and then set about then trying to get the permissions for the health board to give approvals. There was some real, um, I wouldn't say it was straightforward. Uh, there was some resistance. People didn't quite understand why we would give um, land to somebody to run a business on. Um, so we have to sort of explain about the benefits, the benefits to our communities, benefits to our patients, and also the realisation that the NHS doesn't have to be the primary deliverer of healthcare. We can get really good measurable outcomes by working with partners. Um, so once, once all that was explained, um, it was great, and the health board became really supportive of it, and we finally got the approvals in November of last year. And they've been really committed to it. So we've given the CSA a 10 year lease on a peppercorn rate. And then in exchange, then that we can, um, they, they, will, they can work with our patients. And in exchange, we'll also get look to get food to um, on a regular basis to feed our patients as well. So CSA start on site this week, actually. Um, the first harvest is expected to be next year. They're going to spend the next 12 months getting all the infrastructure in place, preparing the soil, getting ready for planting. And with the field that we've given them, which I'll talk about in a minute now, we're expecting to feed around about 250 households a year. So we have the next slide, please. So, as I said, within Morriston, we have land. Um, we've got 55 acres of land spare at the moment. Most of it is earmarked for future healthcare development. But like I said, I did have that the top field, which is the gridded area, um, which was unsuitable. You can't see from that picture, but the topography of the land doesn't lend itself for building. But it's ideal for, for, it's ideal for growing. Um, so it's, it's, it's perfect for that. So we can have the next, uh, next slide, please. So members subscribe, like I said, on a monthly basis. They can cancel at any time. Uh, people can either have, have the option of having a large box or a small box of vegetables. And then produce then is uh, collected on a weekly basis from a, a locally agreed collection point. The CSAs don't tend to advertise where they are because obviously they don't want people going and stealing the produce. Um, volunteers are not required to be members. Um, and equally, you know, uh, if, if you remember, you don't, you're not required to be a volunteer. It's inclusive and everybody's welcome. No surplus food goes to waste. 
any surplus food is donated to local food banks and charities. Um, for example, Matthew's House in Swansea that run a, a cafe for homeless people. Next slide, please. So there is a uh, volunteering and social prescribing opportunities. As I said, uh, one of the things, one of the things we've built into the lease with the CSA is that we can, uh, they'll work with our patients. They already do some work with TBIS, which is our brain injury unit. Um, they'll be looking to do, working with patients that we've got to do stroke rehabilitation and also uh, people who experience functional neurological disorders. Um, and also social prescribing. Very often people hear about social prescribing in terms of gym memberships, but having social prescribing in terms of going to do some gardening is quite a new concept and one that we're sort of exploring further with them. Can have the next slide, please? So the CSA get a lot of their funding or some of their funding from um, local authorities. So they, they participate in the preschools programme. They work with health visitors and fly and start teams. And they do a lot of, with um, families and with, with young children, providing space for them to meet and share problems. And also it helps with child development and uh, health and wellbeing. And the next slide, please. So they also work with a healthy schools program. So children are out in the air, um, exercising, gaining practical experience, and, and showing children where vegetables come from. Very often, you know, the, a lot of the uh, families that we work with, children uh, are, not, are not used to having fresh vegetables, or they don't know where they come from. So the learning about that is also reducing food poverty because, like I said, nothing goes to waste, and um, any surplus food goes to those families that need it the most. Uh, they also do basic cooking skills and teaches them some uh, sustainable growing techniques as well. Next slide, please. Uh, this is my final slide. So this is not all about gardening. So they have a really good um, sort of supportive community within the CSA. Uh, these pictures were taken pre-pandemic, obviously. Um, it builds and strengthens communities. They have uh, they form friendships. They have social evenings. Um, and it's just a really positive thing to do. And hopefully, like I said, you know, we're starting the CSA. It's coming on site this week. And we're hoping it's going to be really successful going forward. Thank you. Right, so it's, it's over to me. Um, delighted to, to be here today and be able to tell you a little bit about some of my research and how that fits into a, a one health approach or how how we should do that a bit better than we do at the moment my research is all about how we connect ourselves to our communities our neighborhoods how we get out and about and i look at that across a life course perspective particularly interest in in older people and aging and how we still connect to the things we want to do but of course as part of all of that transport is a key element of it and transport has issues in terms of um, being detrimental to our health or supporting our health in, in different ways. And lots of that health that we've looked at is in terms of, um, and I'll go into detail a little bit of this in a minute, in terms of our own human health and in terms of environmental health. And we've done far less, I think, on, on the relationship of that between animal health and transport. So moving on to the next slide. I think everyone's done a great job so far at keeping to, to time and I just hope that the the two psychologists left at the end of the day can can do the same so myself and, and Nigel's going to pick up some of the points I say in a minute so um, uh, this is the overview of what I want to give in the presentation today and um, if I go off at tangents or in, off into the distance tell me off and stop me but these are the things you need to take home from today so like I say we've got lots of evidence of how transport affects human health both positively and negatively lots of research beginning to be some practice uh, uh, adoption of some of the techniques um, we've got long-standing evidence of transport and environmental health sustainability climate change and those kind of things but we've got far less research on transport and animal health there's little bits and bobs that that we've been involved with and, and bring together. But really what the One Health approach, of course, tells us to do is it's all very well having those strands of knowledge, but we've got to bring that together. And I still don't think we do that particularly very well. So this is a really timely initiative um, to try and do that in Wales. So next slide, please. It's timely because um, myself and, and Sarah Jones at Public Health Wales have been given um, some funding from Healthcare Research Wales 
to look at uh, transport and health and integrate transport and health practice and policy along with academic practice, centre it around Wales, but also draw uh, internationally on that and um, bring together people working in those different sectors. And particularly it's around human health. And that's novel at the moment. You know, there's we probably banged on about this for the last sort of, 25, 30 years to try and get um, health onto people who, who look at transport's agenda and, and vice versa, that transport and getting out and about is an important determinant of health. And that's beginning to happen at long last. But just as it begins to happen, of course, we start realising concepts like One Health, where we've got to look wider than that. And you'll find if you just concentrate solutions on human health or you concentrate solutions on environmental health, you're missing some of the problems. It's like filling up a half filled up balloon and you squash one problem, but you create it elsewhere. So moving on to the next slide you'll see there's some of the evidence we're getting together on uh, the relationship between human health and transport so there's uh, uh, in these four areas community severance and community connections um, and how transport builds that together or doesn't as the case may be you see the the photo on there is for those of you who probably don't recognize it and those of you do that's Port Talbot and um, how the M4 severs the community in half there but connects it at the same point to places further away so you can both reduce your uh, local connections and neighborhoods and ability to get out and about but also connect yourself to further away so some of that comes at different costs and benefits for different parts of society and we often find that those in more deprived areas um, are actually actually also very transport deprived as well. So that influences health outcomes as well. And one of the reasons why deprivation um, has poor health outcomes is a lack of ability to be able to walk and get out and about in those areas. Lack of access to, to private vehicles to do longer journeys just makes it all much more difficult. So there's health and wellbeing impacts of that. Underneath that, there's road traffic casualties and injuries. We know we, we sort of account for around 153,000 casualties a year in the UK that end up in hospital. Uh, been a huge improvement in numbers of that over the last sort of 20, 30 years, but that's often for those who are traveling in vehicles themselves and passed on some of that human cost of injury to, to those more vulnerable road users, particularly walking and cycling, which is still um, found in high numbers, particularly those um, who are older, particularly older pedestrians and also younger drivers overrepresented in those injuries that, that end up in hospital or, or deaths. Um, and in those living in areas of high deprivation, again, are much, much more likely to be injured or, or killed from a road collision than those in the uh, highest um, socioeconomic areas. So big socio uh, uh, imbalances, if you like, there as a result. We know lots of stuff about pollution as well. So top right hand uh, box, um, huge number of deaths attributed to pollution of one um, part or another of which road transport and air transport contributes a huge amount to. Um, some more direct health consequences, asthma, emphysema, lung cancer, that kind of thing, narrowing arteries, it weakens muscles, can also starting to be more and more research that links it to stroke and, and dementia, though there still needs to be more research on that. And the final part of that where we know lots of evidence is that about active travel, encouraging people to be more active in their mobility. So walking and cycling has huge benefits for cardiovascular disease, uh, reduces high blood pressure, improves mental health, um, and can reduce all cause mortality by about 20% for those who, who manage to do lots of walking and, and cycling. But we've got low levels of active travel in the UK. Um, people talk about obesogenic environments, very difficult to walk very long distances, poor quality pavements. Um, are we design our environment around vehicles rather than walking? Lots of problems and issues with um, that. So next slide, please. So that's the human health elements. And also related to that, we have lots of information about environmental health stuff. So urban design, planning community related to, um, you can move on to the next slide, that's fine. <laughs> Uh, moving me on quickly. Urban design, planning and community bits. That's uh, we've known for ages about um, how we design our, our environments, it influences different ways that the planet can be protected or not, as the case may be. We see more and more tarmacking of, of places, whether that's on the microscopic level of driveways, for example, being created because people can't park their cars outside their house, to more and more industrial estates, residential blocks being placed at the edge of town or city centres, which used to be 
be green creates a huge difference in the biodiversity levels can create huge um, uh, problems with flooding in particular for example but lots of other bits and bobs as well and a huge amount the more you use concrete for these kind of things that's really bad for the environment as well high in co2 manufacturing high in heavy water use that that kind of thing and on the right hand side there climate change so vehicles release about 1.6 billion tons of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere across the world each year uh, and we know that has a huge influence on on climate change uh, as a whole we know less about animal health but there's some good uh, research about animal deaths and injuries and um, you know how that affects the biodiversity as well so it's changes to habitat and there can be trials to build people out of those zones uh, uh, so that people can still travel so you you build bridges over where animals move between um, but then that has consequences on other elements as well and finally uh, logistics is a big element of moving animals around um, between um, uh, well, off to market from from agriculture to market and different parts of that, whether that's stress, injury, illness, and that further affects the 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 health of of animals. But that needs uh, further research in those kind of areas, and certainly needs further research joining it together with the other elements. If you move on to the next slide, so just to conclude with two main points before I finish off. So we've got to move to the centre of that really. Uh, useful diagram that that Mark introduced at the at the start. So, like I said, we know a bit about human health. That's becoming more and more. Uh, uh, we'll get more and more research and knowledge and putting policy into practice of that. So we start thinking about encouraging people to be more active in their travel, helping people out of their cars. And on the right hand side, we we know lots of stuff about environmental health. Um, for example. Uh, in the data picture they're moving people towards electric vehicles and like I said the animal health down the bottom needs further research but we do start introducing things like uh, creating uh, continuous fields over the top by allowing people to continue with their journeys underneath but the problem is if you don't bring all those together of course you're only looking at um, solutions to one part of that health and not joining it together so you end up with electric vehicles that are still bad for people's health because they still create community severance for example um, you get um, movement of animals across the top but you're using more concrete underneath to allow the cars to travel through bridges you're creating active travel places at the top but you've got rid of some of the biodiversity at the top and I, I still don't think we join that together very well so moving on to the next slide um, so how do we get there we definitely need more research on the solutions we've got lots of evidence in lots of those fields and we need more in animal health but lots of those those other fields but we've got to look at how we we get the solution we need solutions that work so evaluation is absolutely crucial for that we need solutions that are acceptable to the public that politicians are willing to back and we need solutions that are fair and equitable taking into account those socio-economic um, issues that come out and about as a result of it so how do we get there we need research knowledge exchange and development activity there's roles for interdisciplinary multidisciplinary working for people to come together and look at this it's difficult enough in our own think transport and health network to bring together people in public health um, medical staff nurses doctors occupational therapists to try and talk to traffic engineers to transport planners because although often they 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 uh, come from uh, perhaps have the same overarching vision it, they're speaking very different languages have very different priorities and bring that together let alone if we take a one health approach and bring all those different um organizations together that that need to happen there so there's a chance we've got to work more closely with organizations and groups so there's got to be intersectorial working for that to happen and therefore also we've got to work with the public on this a role for co-development or co-design with the public out in the community what will people tolerate what will they understand um, when we talk about bringing these issues um, together and again we don't do that very well at the moment we have, find it hard enough to just look at one of those elements like reducing speeds to 20 miles an hour to reduce the number of injuries or collisions or to reduce the um, uh, negative side effects of, of pollution and we still get a lot of resistance to it but I think the public still feel very much done to rather than brought along with these kind of elements and if we're going to do more intersectorial working and more transdisciplinary um, uh, working the public need to have a voice within all of that as well and I think Nigel's going to pick up on some of those points in a minute so just over to my final slide please so that's our transport and health network and as I said that's a relationship between us at Aberystwyth University and Public Health Wales 
um, we're funded by Health and Care Research Wales to generate new knowledge in transport and health, to bring people together and up people's knowledge and skills in transport and health from those different disciplines and backgrounds and get more and more people involved in it, including the public. And we've this is centred particularly around human health, but I think we're, we'd make a big mistake if we only looked at human health. So it'd be really good to build in the one health approach to this and think more joined up about how it affects those different parts of, of health for our environment, for animals and for um, and for human to bring that together. So if anyone's got any good ideas on that, bring us to um, uh, bring it to the table and get involved in think there's the website there's the email address do do get involved i'd be delighted to to hear from you and, and bring this together so thank you very much for your time I'm just going to briefly come in um, before Nigel starts. Sorry, Nigel, just to say to everyone, um, we are going to run a little bit over, but we really want to uh, hear what Nigel has to say. And then um, thanks to everyone who's been answering questions as we go. So hopefully most questions have been responded to. So without further ado, over to you, Nigel. Thanks. Thanks very much. That's great. OK, um, I'll I'll skip something that I was going to say. I was going to summarise what people uh, were uh, reviewing in the presentations today. I was busy scribbling down notes, but what we found was a close link between what One Health is and the importance of people and human beings in ensuring that that change comes about. Um, and what we found, we really, we found that when Gosha started beginning, uh, bringing about the idea of um, One Health and avian flu, and then Adam talked about uh, not being able to avoid the psychology associated with farmers and farming behaviour. Um, Amanda's discussion about community and psychology uh, 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 community farming, community farms and psychology and working together as a group to move forward in a number of different areas was um, was very clearly, in my opinion, applied psychology, I would say that, wouldn't I? Um, and then, of course, um, Charles's work on uh, human health and transport and linking that to uh, a One Health and his, and his think um, approaches are focused um, um, also on something which I'm going to talk about, please. So can I have the first slide, please? So, and the next one. Thanks. So what I'm going to have a go at describing here relatively quickly, I won't go too far over, I promise, is that I want to identify the role of psychology and society to this. I want to highlight the utility of psychology and how psychology, I think, has a key, um, a key, uh, a key role in this uh, in terms of implementation um, in policy design and making sure that the policies all line up together with one kind of focus uh, and to optimise the impact of any engagement that, um, that we in our different disciplines um, have. I'm going to talk to you very briefly also about the principle of behaviour change uh, and the idea that how a broader interdisciplinary approach, that's a word we've heard quite a lot today isn't it, approach that can help us to achieve those aims. Next slide please. Uh, so this is another one of those Venn diagrams but I'll, I'll give it a go from a psychology perspective here. This, so this, this is really a, um, my rendition of uh, what health psychology is. Uh, so we have biological and physical health, obviously. We have psychological health, which you hear so much about in the news these days. Um, we have uh, health associated with social psychology and social and community engagement and well-being. And what we see there is the crossover in between, which is this focus, this middle point, which Charles is kind of um, uh, indicating in the diagram that we were given um, um, earlier on by Mark, um, uh, which is this, this focus on health right in the middle. So really, this is this this is a kind of a, a very a, a simplification really I suppose of, um, of what health psychology is and how it might link to a number of different areas and psychology engages with uh, human health and also um, um, non-human animal health uh, in terms of comparative psychology in a number of different areas and we're working together to develop um, uh, some animal behaviour work in in Aberystwyth and I should be talking to the, the, um, the vets uh, about relevant psychology in their in their courses next year so I'm uh, we're, we're bringing uh, psychology to uh, veterinary science, which is which is good. Um, and these things um, engage. So there are a number of topics in here which could, which, which will make sense in terms of the psychology associated with one health. These are disease in, uh, interventions, sources of disease, food and water security. We've heard about so far uh, the paucity of uh, access to power and uh, resources uh, resources available for that, with things getting so much more expensive. Uh, the health issues associated with diet activity, lifestyle changes, socio-psychological factors. So this is of interest to uh, people in, who have an interest in psychology and community and sociology. Uh, we need to identify where both human and non-human animals are relevant here in terms of diet and well-being uh, and people's perceptions of diet 
and perceptions of well-being. That's something else we need to we need um, we need to highlight here. It's just important to remember that uh, what well-being actually is and people's perceptions of those well-being of, of what well-being is actually two different things in very many cases. Uh, and people's thresholds for what it means to be well uh, a change um, as a function of their experiences, their environment, and um, and their psychology. Um, we can think about some of the topics we've we've, um, we've that have arisen today. So Charles um, talks about transport. Some of lots of his focus um, is on aging and, and uh, recent and healthy aging uh, um, in, and psychology associated with that. And you can see how aging will fit into each one of these examples. So this really is the is is a way of kind of fitting material into psychology. Can we have the next slide, please? So the role of the psychologist here, I'm going to, simplicity and for argument's sake, is to identify psychological, social and behavioural, that's important, behavioural issues that influence health for good and bad. And that can be human health and it can be things associated with health that we as humans have some control over. Or, or, or we have agency over in that. In, in that case, would be the animals that we look after and the health uh, situations that we put them in. Um, and we can influence policy, which we spend a lot of time with. If, if you see policymakers, you'll find you'll typically will find a, a, there are some policymakers in this room. I understand um, that you'll find psychologists sitting around the table as advisors and support to see how um, how communities and society might engage with the, with, with the policies they're bringing to the table. So, and those policies and interventions should improve treatment outcomes and to set and address whatever the key performance indicators are to show that actually our work is, is moving on, how our, how our work is actually engaging. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, this is a deliberately messy slide. I didn't slip, I promise. Um, so what we've got here is, is, is just a, a very broad understanding of what behaviour change is. I think people know what it is. Uh, it, you know, it smells a little bit like psychology, must be psychology. Uh, and people and, and behavior change is something which people engage with on on levels which which suit them parents engage with behavior change with their kids all the time uh children engage with behavior change we're trying to get their parents to do what they want to all the time um uh, organizations engage with behavior change to try and move that organization in a particular direction in terms of the strategy and the, and the hit points that they want to engage with and they use a bunch of different strategies for that so uh, so uh, trans uh, theoretical models, trans theoretical stages, reasoned action, planned behaviour. These are all theories which we engage with. But note, please, I'm not talking about the psychology of behaviour change. And the reason I'm not talking here about the psychology of behaviour change, or at least drawing out the psychology of behaviour change, is because, in my opinion, it's a transdisciplinary approach. It involves people from different expertise and different areas to come in, sit around a table, have dialogue about these things and engage with uh, engage with behaviour change from their different perspectives. And that's the approach that we're taking at Aberystwyth University. Uh, we're drawing people in from a number of different disciplines. Can I have the last and final slide, please? So it's a unified, multidisciplinary approach, which we need to focus on for behaviour change to work well in community and not, we need to bring people with us, listen to those people, see what our communities have to say and engage with them on what their understanding is and to shape and develop their perceptions of things. The stakeholders for these things uh, it, 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 endless. Uh, so government organisations like Public Health Wales, those with an interest in natural resource, in natural resource Wales, things in terms of sustainability, influences in terms of power and uh, energy, those like Charles with an interest in ageing and organisations that have an interest in ageing, age Cymru, etc. Transport experts, logistics experts, policymakers, politicians, etc. These, all these people are stakeholders in this discussion. This is why it's such a huge discussion to have. And the disciplines Again, which I think need to be engaged with this are largely endless. So medicine, very clearly, politics, veterinary science, psychology, sociology, business and marketing, all of these things are being brought into the conversation, into the middle, to try and generate a kind of a metric for having a dialogue for how we can arrive at issues and how we can move this be move behaviour on. So psychology has a role. I would encourage you in your policy making and your thinking to think very closely about the fact that what you're dealing with is human beings. And this is what we do. We do human beings. So it's it's uh, it's important that, uh, that that you recognize the fact that we all recognize the fact that it's a multidisciplinary approach. Don't pigeonhole what people do. I think it's important that we all sit together and engage with this to make sure that we hit those uh, hit our targets. There you go. I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Nigel. And I think that was a really great um, way to finish, actually, because I think it is about bringing us all together. I think it's great to finish on a note of really 
sort of collaboration, interdisciplinary working, but also community engagement as well. Um, it's it you know I think also uh, when you were talking about behaviour change, I was thinking of behaviour change at both a sort of individual level, but also organisation and policy level as well. So I think um, it's a really helpful way, in a way, of bringing together a lot of the themes that we've had across the presentations. Um, and I think also just picking up on something Charles said about the value of looking at things through a One Health lens. I think that was really useful that actually if we're not looking at things through that lens, we're probably missing an issue or what we're doing may have unintended consequences, uh, maybe for our animals and biodiversity or um, so I think um, some really helpful points made there. Um, I'm aware that we're overrun. So um, and I'm also aware that some of the speakers have kindly been uh, answering questions as we've been going through. So I'm hoping that nobody's left with any burning questions. Um, so what I'd like to suggest is that if there are any remaining questions, um, we will get back to people after the event, if that's OK. Um, some of the team, the Public Health Network team, have um, posted an evaluation in the chat and I think they'll probably pop it up again now or email it to you. I know they'd really value your feedback on today's event. Um, I'd really like to thank everybody for joining but for all our speakers as well because I think we've had a really fantastic selection of insights into different elements of this agenda and um, and actually what people are already working on in Wales in this field. Um, so I think that's been really, really helpful and also some nice invitations for people to get involved in different networks. So um, the Think Network um, and also I can see, um, I think Sarah's posted something on the chat about um, the Knowledge Hub has got a One Health Wales network as well that people can join. So lots of invitations there to kind of collaborate, get involved in different people's work. And I think that's how we have to move forward with this because we're all we're all learning. Um, I think that's probably it. Anything else? Um, any other final things that other speakers want to say before we finish? Just want to thank you all for giving your time and uh, for everyone for attending. Um, we hope you've enjoyed the session and um, do come back for another webinar soon. Thank you. Thank you, Diof. Thanks. Diof and Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everybody.